Hey everybody, welcome back. We have another lesson in film history for you this week. Uh, we're covering the entirety of the 1910s, so a whole decade in film history. Uh, we're spending most of our time in the United States for this one, uh, but uh, we are going to start this thing off in Russia with some animation. So stop motion animation didn't originate in the 1910s there were films prior to uh, this decade but not a whole lot of um, these early films survived and you'll kind of notice that there's a trend with that like a whole lot of these early films are just lost to time sometimes they get found though which is really interesting and we'll talk about that with an Australian film a little bit further on in the lecture uh, so let's take a look at this early Russian stop-motion film called The Cameraman's Revenge.
So like I mentioned, a whole lot of silent era films are completely lost to time. In fact, 90% around about um, are completely lost as of now. Um, a few of these things do get found. Um, we'll talk about one film in, that was found in the 1970s or a part of it was found in the 1970s. Likewise, like A Trip to the Moon, if you watched the one that was um, colorized on YouTube outside of my video, um, that was found relatively recently. Um, there's uh, different cuts that have been lost. Um, some scenes have been lost from certain silent era films, even very popular ones. Um, there are there's there's some stuff missing. And sometimes there's just like um, a single still frame from these movies or some kind of record of um, exhibition of the films and no real uh, like footage uh, from the film. So, um, stop motion animation was uh, around as early as 1898. There was a film called The Humpty Dumpty Cir Circus, but um, there is no footage of that, that short animated film. Um, film historians presume that this is probably the first stop motion animation film. Um, but there could be some stuff before that. In fact, some people um, attribute Melier with uh, inventing the idea of stop motion animation. And I think that that's somewhat debatable. Um, like if you watched A Trip to the Moon last week, you, you did. Um, uh, but if you paid attention to the shot when we're like moving towards the moon and the moon goes from an inanimate object to, um, you know, there's a face in there. It's just like special effects makeup. Um, you'll see that kind of hidden cut in there. And, um, that is stop motion animation according to some people. And I think that we're in some subjective territory there. Does that count as animation or does that count just as like a hidden cut that he's doing. So, um, uh, if you said Melier invented stop motion, I wouldn't think that you were wrong or incorrect. Uh, but you could maybe make the argument that it wasn't quite stop animation, stop motion animation just yet. Um, so there's this person named Helena Smith Dayton, um, and she popularized claymation. So it was probably around before her, but, um, if you um, thought that what you just watched was claymation, it is not, right? So those insects are actually little insects there being puppeted um, frame by frame. So stop motion animation works like um, a still over and over again, and when you lay them on top of each other in a fast enough uh, pace, it looks like uh, it, it gives the illusion of motion, right? And I'm sure you've seen some form of stop motion animation before. Um, but uh, claymation is the same process, but it's using um, clay figures, right? So if you don't have clay in stop motion animation, it's just stop motion animation. Uh, if you do have clay, you can call it claymation or stop motion. Either way, um, that would make sense. So um, claymation is stop motion, but stop motion is not necessarily claymation, if that makes sense to you guys. Um, so Helena Smith Dayton, she works with claymation and she probably coined the term stop motion animation. She didn't say that explicitly, but she called her process stop action. And she um, wrote uh, pretty extensively on how it was done. And she's kind of... Um, a uh, founding figure of this this uh, animation type, right? So, um, uh, by calling it stop action, other people called it stop action. Eventually, I guess it became stop motion at some point, but we don't really know when that took place exactly. Uh, so, the guy that you saw, or the the film that you saw, was made by a guy named Vladislav Stervich, and he's um. I guess often overlooked in terms of his influence on stop motion animation, but um, he 
uh, made things a lot more complex. Uh, he refined the uh, methods a lot more. And even though this seems a little bit rudimentary for 1912, this is uh, very complex uh, in terms of its animation quality. He mostly worked with these insects and uh, maybe his most famous work was, I think it's called The Insects Christmas. And you can draw like a direct line from Stairvich to um, those 1960s uh, Christmas specials that came that were very popular in the United States and you've probably seen them before there's like a Santa Claus one and the Rudolph one and then from there you can draw a direct line to Miyazaki and Studio Ghibli so the chronology of um, these very early animations all the way to today's more critically acclaimed animation. There's a, a direct through line. Everything sort of connected. So in the United States, the 1910s were a period of the patent wars. So that's kind of an Edison thing. So if you remember from last week, Edison had a ton of patents on his inventions. He had more patents on a single invention than he actually had inventions. Um, and anyone who sort of violated these patents or used things from these patents for their own works, uh, Edison would then sue one to, you know, make money off of the other company's profits and two um, to kind of prevent that other company from interfering with his business. So um, there were other exhibitors of films in the eight late 1890s and early 1900s though remember that edison was a little bit late to the uh, projector game so he couldn't um he couldn't lay claim to every film projector in the united states so um, there were these other companies that could exhibit films and one company the vitagraph company uh, worked with edison pictures and they would exhibit just edison pictures but then they started to make their own films too and they're mostly like uh, newsreels so at the time there's no television there's newspapers but no television and a lot of people wanted to see their news in a different kind of way so uh, these newsreels would be um, shown before films people would come in to the, uh, see a film that maybe they've seen several times before but the newsreels specifically would bring these people back to see what's going on in the world um, a lot of these newsreels were um, propaganda, uh, so depending on which theater you went to, the news was kind of bent towards um, uh, what what that theater or what that company sort of believed. Um, so Vitagraph's not the only company. There's eight total production company, companies in the United States outside of Edison Films, so that's nine total. Um, Edison sued all of these companies regularly for infringing on his patents. Um, so because they were making their own films and he had the patent for the motion picture camera, um, he, he insisted that anyone who makes films of their own um, is violating his patent. Um, and, you know, so many of these things were created that he couldn't really keep up with all of these lawsuits. Uh, but it was enough of a nuisance for all of the production companies that wanted to continue to make their films and show them along with Edison films uh, that they approached Edison with a proposal for a trust. So the idea between these eight production companies and Edison films was hey, we're all going to get together. We're going to control then um, production. Edison Films makes all the movies. We'll make some uh, newsreels and stuff. Uh, we'll con control the distribution of these films, where they go, which theaters they go to. And then we'll uh, control exhibition of the films too. So it's a complete monopoly on um on the industry so edison films uh edison decides yes i will uh join this trust 
Uh, they strike some kind of deal, uh, and they also bring in George Eastman. So that's the guy who makes Kodak film. So he has the patent on the flexible film material that's absolutely necessary for every single film camera. So now, um, even if someone wanted to maybe start up on their own, they have no chance, right? Because they would need to uh, have permission from George Eastman as well. And because he's part of this trust, he's not going to give it. So the trust consists of seven of those companies, George Eastman and uh, Edison Film. One of those companies that approached Edison was left out, and that's Biograph. And it, it may be a little bit confusing as to why they were left out, but I have suspicions, but you know, uh, take it with a grain of salt. It's a bit of speculation. So uh, Biograph was left out of the trust and Edison insisted on suing them into oblivion. Um, and what I would believe is um, Biograph was working with uh, William Dixon, who had moved on from Edison, working on films and film technology. Um, so remember, he went to work with... Um, uh, Woodville Latham from last week on a projector. Uh, so um, Edison's like, nope, not going to give Dixon any more money. Uh, and then uh, Biograph managed to stay alive by purchasing a patent for the Latham Loop. And I think that it was in our timeline uh, last week, but we didn't really talk about it too much. So the Latham loop is um, just a process by which the film runs through a camera with a little bit of slack in the film. So what, what um, the film cameras had an issue with was as uh, film ran through the camera, that flexible film material would often break in the camera. So you couldn't do very long shots. But with the Latham loop, uh, you could run an entire reel through a camera without it breaking. So it was a really important um, advent in the uh, film camera technology. And it made things uh, possible like feature films, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, we're not quite there yet, though. So um, after, after the Latham Loop was purchased by Biograph, they're kind of... They have a stake in this whole film industry thing that, you know, now the trust needs to, you know, work with Biograph to get that Latham loop. Um, and after after uh, Edison tried suing them and saying, like, you can't possibly purchase this patent and the courts upheld their purchase, uh, then Edison bought Biograph or brought Biograph into the trust. So uh, this trust is called the MPPC, or Motion Picture Patents Company, and it now holds every major patent associated with filmmaking and dictates how films are made in the United States. Um, so uh, every film now has like a very strict standard. Um, every film is a one real film, so no films go over 16 minutes. There's um, a slight way around that, and we'll talk about it when we get to the um, feature film area of this. Uh, feature films wouldn't be approved until 1914, so there, there's a good, good deal of time where it's just one real films, and anytime you went to a theater, all you're seeing is up to 16 minutes at a time. Um, and all performers go uncredited. And I think that this is the key um, mistake that the trust made. So um, if you're a famous stage actor and you want to do some kind of film work, um, your name will not be credited in the film. You just um, go up there and do your thing. So um, uh, at the time, I think the idea was that uh, people should be um, drawn to the film itself and they didn't want to pay for like stars to be in these films and instead you know um, be drawn to the um, spectacle of the film um, <clears throat> so because in New Jersey where all all these uh, film production companies including Edison uh, were housed um, no one could really get a leg up 
um, as an independent artist. A bunch of independent film producers moved to Hollywood in protest of the MPPC. Um, and that includes a whole lot of actors. Uh, these independent film producers uh, gained a lot of popularity with their films because uh, some actors were very charismatic and interesting. So if you think about Charlie Chaplin, Charlie Chaplin is one of the actors that moved to Hollywood with uh, these independent film producers and worked outside of the MPPC system. Um, and by 1915... Uh, the MPPC would be completely terminated by the U.S. government. So if you've had some history classes or U.S. history classes, you'll remember that trusts aren't looked upon in a, a good light by the U.S. government. Um, they're, they're a bad thing. And once the, the uh, federal government like honed in on this is a monopoly and can't exist, um, competition can't exist in the industry, uh, they broke this thing up finally. Um, so let's take a look at a one reeler. So those uh, 16 minutes or less films. Um, we're going to take a look at uh, Lois Weber's uh, short film Suspense. It's from 1913. And you'll see a lot of the, the things that we learned about with Edwin S. Porter just kind of um, uh, advanced upon in this short film. So let's take a look and we'll talk about it.
All right, so this is the director of the film you just saw, and she is maybe a first prominent female director. It's always kind of tough to say what is the absolute first, uh, given that so many films are lost to time. Um, she worked for a subsidiary of Universal, so not Universal directly, but like um, a company within Universal. Um, and that Universal is one of the, those companies that uh, jumped ship from New Jersey and went to Hollywood. Um, and now they're the oldest exi existing production company in the entire United States. So if you've ever seen that Universal logo at the beginning of a film, that's the, the oldest production company that still exists. Um, she's considered one of the first auteur filmmakers. So um, if you've never heard this term before, auteur literally means author. Um, so um, if you've ever kind of heard it suggested as like the director being the um, driving creative force behind a film, like they um, have a strong influence, not just on how the actors perform, but also like the cinematography and the editing and, um, just every creative aspect of a film. That's, um, the idea be behind an uh, auteur, like an author, like the, the director is the author of the film is the idea. Um, so auteurs weren't really, like that 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 term wasn't really coined until the french new wave and i think if you um really try to remember lois weber when we get to the french new wave um you'll see some similarities between what they're trying to do uh, lois weber is experimenting with film um uh, as film is still kind of um, uh, figuring out its path forward and the French New Wave uh, are challenging the norms that were established over decades and they're kind of borrowing from um, uh, early filmmakers and those experiments. So uh, she worked on approximately 350 films as an actor, writer, director, and producer. So she's kind of like a renaissance woman. Um, we say approximately 350 films because, again, a whole lot of films are just lost to time. So we don't know what some of the films, like her, her most famous film, we, we just don't know what it even looks like because it's gone. Um, but she worked not just as a director and writer and producer, but also an actor. And you probably noticed like, hey, she looks kind of familiar. She was, you know, the main actress from the film that we just watched as well. So um, she directs and stars in uh, Suspense that we watched. Uh, she is known for her innovative composition techniques. And yeah, I think that you probably noticed this. That's one of the standout things besides just the parallel action that you saw where we're cutting back and forth between two things that are happening at the same time. Um, you saw a shot through a keyhole and these high angle and low angle shots when she's looking outside and down and uh, looking from down and up those those uh, extreme kind of angles that look way more modern that w than what we saw um, a few years previous. So you know we're what five years uh, separated from Porter. Um, so you know like major innovations here, and not everything that she did like caught on now, but later on um, you would see this. As, as a fairly regular thing in film. So that whole split screen that you saw, so simultaneous action happening in multiple places, but it all happens in the same frame at the same time. Again, that's one of those like French New Wavey type things. So the 1960s, the French New Wave would do stuff just like that. And all of a sudden, like contemporary film in the United States and all across the globe would um, kind of borrow from the French New wave and make it like a standardized thing so if you see um, a film from the 1970s onward uh, you might see something like that weird split screen thing but from you know the 1920s until um, the 1960s you probably didn't see anything like that so uh, she was also the first American woman to direct a feature film in 1914. This is kind of uh, what she's really known for as being the first 
first woman to direct a feature um and it's called the merchant of venice and uh we can't watch it because it doesn't exist anymore um it's quite unfortunate uh it's probably um the thing that lois weber is most known for or in the history books for um but uh maybe it'll show up eventually maybe someone will find it in a dumpster somewhere and i'm not messing with you with that like lots of films are found in dumpsters for some reason um she uh produced boundary pushing content for the time okay so um yeah she's she's a female filmmaker and she makes female centric films so she made a film that kind of uh, talked about uh, birth control, which is something that was controversial at the time um, and still kind of controversial now. So imagine 19, uh, the 1910s uh, watching a film about that or um, hearing someone talk about that. And she also had a film that featured some nudity and that got that caused quite an uproar. If you watch it, it's very, very tame. It's not really like... Um, uh it, it's just kind of like a sheer dress kind of thing it's it, it's firmly non-sexual nudity uh but at the time again uh fairly controversial um so she used her voice in a fairly prominent way and um she for a female filmmaker which was rare at the time and became even more rare uh in the the coming decades and stuff uh she she certainly uh expressed her her um female perspective as a director so as hollywood was rising to prominence and the mppc was on the verge of being broken up as a trust by the federal government uh, the feature film started to become a thing, um, but feature films um, outside of the United States were around, um, you know, almost a full decade before they would become uh, a popular way to watch films in the U.S. So the story of the Kelly gang is um, from Australia, and it's uh about an hour long so that would be a very short feature if if you're used to watching contemporary films um and it was thought to be completely lost for a very long time but in the 1970s someone found a reel of it 17 minutes um i i believe they found it in a dumpster so it does exist uh but it wasn't exactly a um influence on the united states developing their feature films instead it sort of happened naturally so we had one reels we had one reel films 16 minutes but they were produced as serials so you would come back and see the next episode almost like a, a television program uh, but people just wanted to watch each of the reels in order and all of a sudden that became a feature film so you have uh five 16 minute long reels and then all of a sudden you have over an hour of content that way you also had over in europe like in germany um uh, films being produced as feature films so they didn't have that mppc um uh, legislation i guess where you could only make one real films to make their lives easier as exhibitors um, so that was pretty popular over in europe um, and that influence sort of um, pushed things in a certain direction in the united states but um, the big thing was those serials and watching them in order and all of a sudden it just made sense to uh, make long form films because of the popularity that already existed with the serials so this is dw griffith um he's an interesting guy he's a he's a really probably terrible person um uh he he's a filmmaker that gets a lot of recognition in film history and we're going to take a look at one of his films so long as um it you can sit through it uh, uh, but like he he made a lot of claims in this early era of of film history about like what he did and what he accomplished and um, not a whole lot of them are accurate but because of 
who he was and his influence on like the 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 uh, Hollywood um, society uh, all of those things kind of stuck to him as, as being like real and accurate. So he is like, um, a very prominent figure in propaganda and that's really not what he's known for, but that's really what he did very well. Um, so he put out pamphlets about how he invented, like he, he studied under Porter initially, um, and he claims that he made 500 films and he also claims to have invented parallel action, but he didn't because Porter came before him. He invents, he, he, he uh, says that he invented, um, close-ups, which, you know, he didn't because we saw Porter with the, the, uh, the, um, cowboy shooting at us last week and that was before griffith did anything like that um and he claims that he invented the feature film which you know like his feature film came in 1915 and we just saw um from the the previous slide that 1907 was the first feature film um so all of these things <laughs> Um, are just completely inaccurate. He also claims to have developed more nuanced performances with his characters. So like um, his characters aren't quite as over the top. And um, maybe, maybe that's kind of accurate. I'm not sure. Like we see um, uh, Lois Weber doing the same things at around the same time. So I wouldn't say that he did this necessarily. And you see that little quote from him there where he says, I changed everything. Um, you, you can tell just how self-important he is, you know? Um, uh, but we're going to take a look at his feature film because of it, its importance in a different kind of way. Um, people in the film history books that you like, if you bought a film history book for this class and it was published in the last like a decade or longer ago, um, chances are it would have just like almost completely focused on close up, close up, uh, cinematography in the film and, um, editing techniques and, you know, cross cutting and stuff. And then just maybe glanced over the fact that it is incredibly racist and it's uh it's racist propaganda to get you to um uh be swayed towards uh uh racism being the right way to be so this is um a quote from the academy awards when they gave uh griffith like a, it wasn't really a lifetime achievement award but kind of that you know so um, not specifically for any film but just like for his work and contributions to film as a whole. And I think that this kind of um, helps emphasize just how um, history has kind of been uh, glossed over um, because of his influence. So uh, D.W. Griffith was a founding member of the Academy. So the Academy that um, awards things. He was, he was one of their main members. So, um, the nepotism that is there, um, is not lost on most people. So this is the birth of a nation. This is, um, D.W. Griffith's claim to fame. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as much as it, it's lauded for its, its technical achievements, really, uh, what you should look at more than anything is its popularity with people. So historians approximate that the, the first run, so the first time it was in theaters, um, not exactly sure how long it stayed in theaters for its first run, but you know, it had several uh, re-releases and stayed in theaters for decades. Uh, but just in that first run, it made $60 million, um, which is humongous. Um, like the, the ticket fees were higher than most films because it's like this epic that, you know, kind of hadn't been seen before. It's, it's longer than the films, um, the, the, the feature films that were in existence at the time. It's like three hours long. Um, so they they felt justified in charging more for tickets but even uh accounting for um the premiums on admission fees if 
if everyone just watched it one time in that first run, um, a third of the entire United States population would have seen that film. Um, so, uh, pretty much everybody had seen the birth of a nation at some point, if you lived in the, this, uh, time period. Um, and it maintained its role as the most popular film of all time until gone with the wind in 1939, which is, you know, still one of the most popular films of all time. Um, the, uh, the film was screened in the white house and it would be the first, uh, film to be screened in the white house. And Woodrow Wilson, the, the, uh, president at the time called it like writing history with lightning. So Woodrow Wilson gives it his seal of approval as, um, as accurate, historically accurate, which is very, very troublesome. So because of, you know, the, the president's kind of putting this this film on a pedestal and the popularity in general um we see the kkk reform in georgia so um the ku klux klan existed before and kind of fell apart for various reasons it wasn't that popular of a group um but in 1915 it became a, a really big deal and like the whole idea of the the sheets and the masks and stuff the the what you expect the KKK to look like now that was all established in the birth of a nation. Like that, that's not what these people looked like before. Um, so, uh, by the mid 1920s in the wake of this film, the KKK would have four to 5 million members and just like trying to uh, give you a sense of the scale of this. It's like one l l women can't be in the KKK um, any minorities can't be in the KKK. It's only like white males and, uh, four to 5 million members. Um, I mean, that's what's claimed by the group. So that is a ton of people that that's a humongous group of white supremacists. And, uh, in 1925, they marched on Washington with 25 to 50,000 people. Um, so, uh, very, um, influential this film is and not in a good way at all so if we try to find some kind of uh silver lining in um the the release of this film and its popularity and the rise of the kkk um we can see it in the pushback uh to the the group and the pushback to the film in general so like the naacp i'm sure you've heard of um, kind of rose to prominence. It, it existed before the film, but because enough people were like outraged by the content of the film, um, it, a lot of, uh, additional members and like the, the group became recognized and, uh, it petitioned for censorship and banning the film in certain areas and was mostly unsuccessful, but, um, the protests resulted in some theaters just saying like, I'm, we're not gonna, it's not worth the trouble. So like they, they tried to get, um, like governments to shut down the film and most of those governments were, um, not receptive to that, but, um, uh, protesting actually did work a little bit. So by 1917, that's two years after um, the f uh, the film was released, uh, the NAACP had um, a ton of legal resources and had 90,000 members. That's uh, that pales in comparison to four to five million um, KKK members, uh, but that is a, still a, a significant group of people. Um, and that gives me, you know, a little bit of hope at the time. Um, uh, several filmmakers also pushed back against the propaganda and birth of a nation. So birth of a race, um, is, you know, uh, I have a link here and I'll link it in the, the, the description and it, it's fine for you to like, maybe, uh, take a look at. Um, and it's maybe an option for you if you choose not to look at Birth of a Nation. Um, that said, it's not, um, it's hard as in the right place, <laughs> uh, but, but it, it, you know, it, it's still um, uh, a product of its time and not, you know, uh, exactly what I would want to see in, um, in a response to birth of a nation. 
Uh, but it is a direct response. Um, like this is, they they saw Birth of a Nation and said, nope, can't do that. Let me show you um, an opposing point of view. And you think uh, 1918 to 19, from 1915 to 1918, that's a long period between those two uh, films. And Birth of a Race really got like held back from production issues and exhibition issues and stuff. But if you consider that Birth of a Nation um, played in theaters for decades, it was Birth of a Race was still at the same time as Birth of a Nation. Likewise, 1919, Oscar Micheaux begins his career as the first African-American filmmaker, and I don't think without Birth of a Nation and all of the um, negatives of, uh, of that film and people thinking that there really needs to be some kind of response to it, that there would be any kind of... Um, uh, African American filmmakers for you know another few decades, um, but uh, Oscar Micheaux is very interesting, and I think uh, his his film is um, certainly worth watching. So that's that's um, your alternate option if you don't want to watch Birth of a Nation. If you feel like Birth of a Nation might be a little bit too triggering, what I would recommend is that you at least watch like a video essay on the film so you can see like. Uh, aspects of the film that were really troublesome and then watch something like within our gates instead and comment on that in your blog rather than birth of a nation um, if you do watch birth of a nation uh, do watch it with the, the the goggles on where you can tell that what it actually is it's not um a a transcendent landmark in film history for its technological achievements and its storytelling techniques but instead it's a very popular uh, propaganda piece intended to revitalize the kkk and it succeeded in that way it is an important piece of film history um, but it's not a um, bright spot or a good thing at all um, so i will link you to uh, the birth of a nation i will link you to within our gates and i'll also link you to uh, birth of a race you have your choice of the three films to watch in their entirety and to write about in your blog if you choose either birth of a race or within our gates i would expect you to at least watch a video essay on birth of a nation to have a better understanding of the content that does exist in the film i will link you to that as well um, so, uh, Birth of a Nation is about three hours long, so we will um, make this lecture just a little bit shorter this week, uh, so you have a little bit more time to watch the actual film. Alright, good luck with this one, and I look forward to reading your writing this week.